Hello, this is Chris Jansen, my website, endevil.life. And I'm here today with the True Media Roundtable. Our discussion today is going to be centered around the idea of the grind. And this is an aspect of slavery that's holding back all people of the world in the modern day. And today I have with me James Ford and Corey Endelrat from uh, NIDA. Nature is the Andrew answer. <laughs> Andrew Lott. Sorry about that. Did I say it wrong? Okay. Yeah, it's all good. Whoops. Anyway, so um, yeah, my I thought first question, you know, people use this term like quotations, the grind. And this is something that's been on my mind. It's a presentation I'm kind of working on right now. So I thought it'd be a good subject to toss around with you guys. So what does that mean to you, Corey, when I say the grind? And is that something that you deal with in life? Oh, I actually love that term uh, because it represents a great deal of courage and persistence to me. Uh, as in like you keep going at it and you never stop. It's a, you don't give up and you just keep, you know, going every day, doing your best, you know, sharing truth, sharing information, always at it. It's kind of like farming. The idea of farming is like a gamer tag where it's like you just keep going and going. Grind is also a common use in gaming as well to represent like you keep you keep going at it and you never stop, you know, and maybe you keep yourself um, busy in other ways so you can keep going at the grind, right? So you keep yourself motivated and inspired by having other things on the side that can allow you to keep grinding. Like, um, for example, whether it's energy or whether it's family or friends cheering you on or whatever it may be, supporting influences so that grind is made possible and somebody having that goal and intention at heart saying, yes, this is what I'm going forward toward and I'm going to go all the way toward it. Like Buddha says, right? You start on the path of truth and you go all the way. Right on. And that's like a very positive look at that term too because it's often used in a more negative way so i like the way that you're sharing <laughs> that aspect of it that's great how does it strike you james when i say the grind yeah i guess you know i my my first the way i perceive it is the, the negative uh way it's used like the grind you know it's always like oh getting back to the grind you know i think um and not to be con contrary i think it is just a different perspective on a word you know but yeah, the grind for me is like I see the image of the old uh, Pink Floyd uh, movie when they, they're putting the people into the, the meat grinder and the people are coming, you know, coming out the other end. So for me, the grind, I think it's the way society, I, I put it back again to like the subjugation of nature where, you know, all our actions have been mechanized, you know, that all, all the things that we have you know, natural things that to get food, to get, and I'm not just, I don't mean to like try to, to sensationalize this aspect of it or to, but it, for me, it's like the grind is like things, things and we, when we get into the rut of life or in the rat race, all these actions we are taking, we, we don't have a, maybe a happy connection to it. When we're not doing what we want, like when we're not living life and taking actions, to get what we need that is really part of our nature or maybe what we would like to do when we're stuck in a rat race and we, all right, we're doing these things because we have to do this for maybe someone's family or just to pay, pay it our own way. And it's an unnatural thing that I have to do. And that for me is like the grind. And you say, and that, and really that's what people kind of term responsibility. It's not responsibility. Am I able to respond to do these things in nature where I can gather what I need to sustain myself and my family? No. Can I engage in this thing that goes against everything that I feel like I want to do, but grin and bear it so I can do this for my family, which is a good thing. You know what I mean? I mean, that's for people to go out and do what they have to do for their family is responsible and the right thing to do, but it's been made a grind. You know what I mean? And it really takes, a, and that's like robbing. That is a death. That is a death of the joy someone has in sharing with their family, whether it be the time that they can't spend with their family or whether it is what it takes out from them to be able to share whatever it is they have with their family or friends or society you know so for me the grind is that thing where people's like all right i gotta do this to do what i gotta do you know so yeah it came up for me because i was looking up um i was looking up the definition that the online dictionaries would use for slavery hmm. i was curious to see you know how does the cambridge dictionary and the online free dictionary, you know, these type of 
how do they define it? And this word that popped up was drudgery. Hmm. And that got me to thinking about, for some reason, the picture that came into my head is from, um, I had to look it up to figure out what it was. It was from Conan the Barbarian. Great. And when Conan the Barbarian is young, he gets put in this like slavery situation. The and, wheel, right? Yeah, he's pushing <laughs> this wheel of pain, right? And he's just, I don't know what that wheel was doing. Maybe it was grinding corn or, you know, it had to be grinding something. But the whole thing was that he just had to walk around and around in this circle, pushing this heavy thing all day long through the snow, through, you know. And I've had jobs where I've been at, um, particularly right now thinking about when I worked for the, for the uh, government, when I worked for the court as a maintenance man. Um, you know, there were a lot of people that would show up every day and they're like dragging their, um, you know, just like looking down, dragging their fingernails on the ground. It's like they're forcing themselves through another day of this thing that they really don't like doing because, you know, there's this cherry at the end of the stick or carrot at the end of the stick, this uh, retirement, you know, looming one day in the future. And, and then so often when we ask ourselves, like, how did we get in this shape to where like uh, freedom is being diminished in, in this country of America that was formerly thought to be a free country. And we can see all these ways where people's freedoms are being limited and diminished. And how come people aren't fighting against it? How come more people aren't speaking out? You know, how come more people aren't talking about the things that we're talking about? Well, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that they feel so burdened by their day-to-day -day life and so tired at the end of the day, there's no energy left to, you know, write their book or do their creative work because they're, they're ground down to a nub, you know, like human beings that are being ground down to, they don't even have the energy to be creative and, and uh, energetic. So that's kind of what popped into my head. And I've been seeing it as another uh, reason when I ask myself why, why things are the way they are, why are people in such a mind control spell is what I called it in my last week's presentation. So, um, Corey, you got any reflections on, on what I'm saying there? Um, how did we get, how did we get stuck um, in this grind? Um, well, I think from our point of view, we can sort of correlate it because if we understand natural law and it's cause and effect, we understand that these things are here for a reason. And that if we understand why those things are the way they are, and we ask the question of why, we can get to the root cause of the problem, you know, which is often very, if I'm just going to, you know, blatantly say it as it is, is order following. Order following is the root cause to pretty much all of the problems that we see in the world. Um, especially order following without conscience, uh, order following by definition, you're suppressing your conscience and deciding right for wrong action for yourself. Instead, you're following someone else's orders. You're following a box. Okay. Now you used the example of carrot, right? Like using a carrot and, you know, maybe using that as a way for somebody to, to follow as a means of um, dependence, if you will, which we see is the opposite of independence, which is of course, um, a freedom type of world because we are in control of ourselves. No one's in control of us. Um, and that is the internal monarchy, right? As opposed to the, you know, external uh, monarchy where people are, are uh, controlling us. Uh, but it's interesting you mentioned that carrot analogy because in my video talking about natural leadership versus unnatural leadership or real and true leadership versus, versus artificial leadership, uh, it actually uses that exact analogy. And it goes into detail about the difference between a boss, you know, somebody who wants to rule over you, who wants power, versus somebody who is trying to influence others in a positive light, showing by action, not seeking power, and helping one another, something that you may refer to as servant leadership, okay? And not being a slave to other people, but to help them you know, while you are, are also on your way up, you're helping them with you, you know, as opposed to using them against uh, them for your own ego. Okay, so there's a difference. There is such a thing as natural leadership. And I think the world is very much detached from that. And because they don't know, because they don't have the knowledge of what is of nature or what is a, a true leader, for example, 
they lack the, the knowledge to say no to those who presume to rule over them when they have actually no right to do so in the first place. So they let these people be in charge of their life. They let their conscience be suppressed and they give themselves excuse to that by thinking that this is the form of leadership, that people need to be ruling over me, that I can't control myself, that other people shouldn't be free, otherwise the world will go insane. And that, oh my gosh, if the slaves were freed, they would run amok and cause a bunch of problems. Oh my gosh, how, we can't live without slavery. It's natural. These are the same excuses people make for slavery or the same exact excuses people make for keeping government. And I also have a chart for that in my video titled Slavery Still Exists, But It's Not What You Think. That video goes in detail about slavery, which you mentioned as slavery, and that's why I wanted to join this meeting in particular, because that video I saw it was very powerful talking about slavery. I even had in that video um, firsthand accounts from former slaves. Like they, there was actually recordings that you can get from slaves, um, and they're online. And if you find those recordings and you match it up to the problems that people have with government, I mean, it's pretty spot on. You know, these people, they grow so attached to their state of servitude and lack of responsibility that they actually like being controlled over, over time, but it actually damages their nature over time. And that's the problem is, you know, and it's so funny that you invite guests that always talk about nature to me. It's so funny, Chris, because, you know, nature is the answer is like my main uh, message. You know, it's, it's the movement that I have. So it's just funny how we always go back to that, but it's because we realize that we're detached from who we are, detached from where we belong, and that we're in a system that is inherently unnatural and has no right to actually exist in nature by natural law. So if people learn about natural law or they learn about their nature, then they can learn about the fact that these people don't have a, you know, a right to exist and that they convinced people psychologically and physically, but psychologically is the worst type of slavery, mental slavery. Frederick Douglass said that himself. He said mental slavery is the worst type of slavery. Martin Luther King Jr. said the same thing. I have all the quotes in that documentary as well. It's astonishing because you see that slavery still exists, and that should be powerful to anybody listening to this. That should be mind-boggling, and, and I think that is something that we should tackle because we, we got rid of some forms of slavery in the past, and now it's time to move forward and get rid of slavery in the full from humanity by understanding what is slavery, what is freedom, how do we define our rights. These are things that if you ask the average person, oh, they think the rights come from some piece of paper. No, your rights come from God. They come from nature. Again, they're taking the source nature and they're manipulating it, imitating it and putting it on a piece of paper or in man-made words and man-made structures and calling that law and calling that rights. <laughs> they're using these terms against people. They're using their own nature against their um, nature. And so what you see happen is people are unable to think for themselves or speak for themselves because their own nature is under attack. So in order to restore our nature, we have to use nature so we don't lose it. Imagine if you saw like a, a colony of ants or uh, a hive of bees and they behave the way that humans organize ourselves, you know, where, you know, one particularly very small group of the ants went around forcing all the other ants to do things their way. How efficient do you think they would be? You know, it, it's funny that nature, which doesn't have governors or kings, you know, it seems to manage quite well, which is very interesting that when you try to talk to people about this idea of we don't need this type of authoritarian religion, they get all like scared, like, how would we ever do things, you know, and you're like, well, look at nature, how does nature do things, it doesn't have a president. So um, yeah, you're really cutting through, um, you know, the grind is sort of an introduction into what is this really called? And there you nailed it, Corey, it's slavery. So um, James, what would you say to that? Um, how do we get into the situation of being stuck in this grind as, as slaves? Yeah, it's, geez, yeah, that's so much, you, you just touched upon so many things. I guess, you know, I guess for me, an answer is, you know, if say, look at that, the, when we, uh, um, I think what is it? I think it was the Thirteenth Amendment, right? When we freed slaves, it seems that you know if we if we took if people say money is the root of all evil, but I suggest that leveraging 
using money to leverage other human beings is really the root of evil. So if we created laws that said, okay, if you want to have a house that's three acres big, it's fine, but you cannot use slave, you, you cannot, we could take, and it's just an idea, I'm not saying, I'm suggesting this, I'm just, it's a, an, it's a suggestion that if we take the leveraging power out of money, okay, you cannot have people, you can't hire people to clean your house, you have to clean it yourself, you know what I mean? There's like certain things of where, if you, taking the leverage out of money, I don't know if that's a good example, but for me, it's taking the, the leverage power out of money so that people cannot leverage human beings but um but how i see i think where where the problem lies is that the structure is in place where it's really economy uh the and i i, I really it struck a chord with me when he was talking about leaders it, it was at a time where character was a principle or character was maybe why we took action and that a leader amongst equals seemed to be how we would have a leader in a group. And it would usually, the person who had the characteristics of a leader would be a leader. But it seems now we've taken so much from, I, I wish I had a graph, I had a chart that uh, went back to the old uh, British title and um, uh, I forget the name of it. It's when they gave people title, when you had title and property, it was more of like how the breakdown of the hierarchy of title in the monarchy was. And we're really going towards that, that type of play. It is, well, really it is. That's really the, the, the corporate structure, if you, you know, and the reward structure. But um, the, really the way I see it is like, the print, it is, it is natural. It, it is natural, it's basic principles. You know, they've taken, we're acting from principles regarding how to serve that structure that the, the, and I hate to, I hate using the words corporate or it's just the structure of management or structure of feeding this, um, uh, how would be a better place to put it? Okay, say in New York City, right? In New York City, you, there was a big, there's a huge like civil servant community, which isn't bad, but a lot of these people sent their kids to school so a lot of them went to school and what do they did? They become part of a management class, but there's only so many managers you can have. So what happens is you have people going into the education system, which really is not really learning to be a leader amongst your fellows, but you're going into a class system, which you're being taught and given a degree. And just because you walk out into the workforce with a degree, doesn't mean you have the skills of a leader, but they have so many people going into this managerial class that we're having people going like some, I had a friend of mine who was a fire uh, firefighter and there was a huge fire in New York city. And he went in and he was a guy that was started out and he was, he was a leader amongst them because he was a firefighter. He didn't go to school, but he, he was firefighter for over almost 20 years, but they had someone in that was graduated from, you know, college. And he was in there giving orders. He said, no, don't do that. He says, I've been doing this for you. It had something to do with heat. He said, don't, he says, listen, guys, we can't listen to what this guy is saying. We have to do this because he just didn't have that experience and it's not knocking him, but I see it all the time now, especially in New York, because it's so, such a small area that we're giving people, and I was actually on the ferry in New, in New York city, Staten Island going to the ferry. And it was a sign that said, leaders aren't born, they're made. So all these ideas are being changed in our psyche because it's just to fuel the system that really doesn't. The education system, now the secondary education system is all going into feeding this centralized economy that is more geared towards propagating the structure that isn't working at the moment. I mean, there's so much, I'm, I'm, I'm babbling a little bit, but I think the point is, is that the system needs to be maintained and, and, and people are acting right now at the moment at any cost of being maintained because they're just so, they've been they're so conditioned to act within it and their reward and their reward and punishment is so tied towards to the system at the moment that the idea of stepping out of it is almost seems like, or, or seems too frightful to step out of it, or they're so conditioned that that is the world, that structure that they're in, that synthetic structure is the world. They don't see like, they don't, you know what I mean? I don't mean, I'm probably babbling a little bit here. But I don't. I think it's to the point where they can't see outside of the structure to even understand 
that that they may be they may be in, in a place of servitude. You know what was really cool that you were bringing up that really struck me, James, was that like I've been on construction for a long time, and in construction there's definitely a hierarchy on a job site in terms of who's in charge or who's to be listened to and who's not. However, it's very different from yes. um, you know the traditional workplace in that oftentimes when whoever's the boss, you know, whoever's wearing the hat of the boss isn't actually right there watching. What happens is whoever has the most knowledge and skill generally tends to kind of lead things and people go to that person to ask questions because they're obviously the person who knows best what they're doing because they have the answers, you know? And, mm -hmm. and it's like much more natural that you see how that works in, in real life, how leadership can actually work. And I've had the, um, you know, really cool experiences in life of getting to do like team training exercises and seeing small groups work together and how lead, different people in a group can be leaders in different ways. You know, someone has a particular skill, then they step forward and they sort of become the leader until we get to a different point in the, in the game or the project or whatever. And then all of a sudden somebody else has that skill. And so there is a more natural flow to how leadership can work and how, you know, who we listen to is people we respect because they've proven it, you know, in the field or in what they do in their yeah. work. And then we're like, okay, I'm listening to that guy. So, you know, what, what I think in my experience of discussing the subject of slavery or what I'm calling the grind is like, people are easy. They'll talk about that. Oh yeah, work is a grind. I have to go in, it's drudgery or um, even the positive aspect like Corey was describing, yeah, I gotta grind away on this till I get it done, that's what it takes. But mm -hmm. when you start talking about slavery, most people don't, um, I wanna use the word empathize, but that's not the correct word. They don't familiarize themselves with that term. They, they familiarize that term with someone tied in chains, someone on a boat rowing, or like I was saying, you know, Conan the Barbarian pushing this big wheel around. So let's try to go around here and discuss how we can bring that term of slavery. How can we help people to understand, you know, your average person that that's actually the condition of humanity. It's not about people, only black people from the past. Yeah, that was one type of slavery, but we're yeah. experiencing a, a different nuance on slavery. How do we get that across to people? And I know Good you've done question. some work on that, Corey, and I'm gonna share that link, but go ahead. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a good idea. Um, slavery is, is a big topic indeed, but it is like, if you want to bring it to natural law principles as it shall, it is a matter of ownership. You know, one person claiming ownership of another, uh, of their body, of their mind, of their soul, essentially, um, you know, because all of that belongs with the individual. Uh, it doesn't belong to somebody else. You own yourself and yourself only. No one has the right to rule over you and claim to have ownership over your life and property than you. That's just a simple fact of the matter. And that's the most suppressed fact of the matter, in fact, <laughs> of all history since the Sumerian Empire, the first system of government, which was a basic structure of masters and slaves. Look up the, look up the system of the Sumerian Empire look it up. And, you know, it was a battle of resource. You keep certain things away from people. And now look who's in charge. I get to be in charge because I have this and you don't, and you're forced to follow me by threat of violence. And that's how you create a hierarchy based in slavery. And it's not voluntary. So it's very different from a workforce, especially too. Um, so there's a lot of dynamics to it. And not to mention going back to leadership, but Larkin Rose talks about how, yeah, there's also natural leadership. You know, people, when we talk about anarchy, we're not talking about like no natural leaders. There's still going to be natural leaders. In fact, that's that actually, that environment allows natural leaders uh, versus the environment that we have now, which is promoting the unnatural leaders that I've spoken of. But um, actually in my video about slavery, I defined what the word slavery means as well. So I know you looked into some of the definitions, Chris. Um, I looked into some of the etymology behind it uh, deeply, and it's pretty powerful stuff. Um, it, slavery comes from the word Slav, right? Slavic people. Um, and there, that word also comes back to robot, 
very interesting how you can tie the words slavery to robotics because we're moving into a world of technology and robotics well if you are a robot at the workplace what are you doing following orders you're programmed to think a certain way and so that's again going back to frederick Douglass and his mental slavery it's the worst kind and i have many uh, diagrams and, and everything in that video talking about mental slavery but Gandhi even says it's uh, mental slavery is the worst. Uh, a lot of people have spoken of it because these are people who tried to free their fellow men in different ways. You know, they didn't necessarily do it by tearing off the chains and, uh, but they teared off the chains in people's heads. Like, oh yeah, we're all equal. The content of our character instead of the color of our skin, these are mental chains. We should have already known that. We should have already known we're equal because we're human beings. Why do we have to free people to that realization? Because something got in the way and deprogrammed them and, well, or, you know, deprogram or program, whatever you want to see from a young age into a certain way of thinking, which is obviously the purpose of uh, the education system or organized religion, or basically all of that, which is a form of religion, which is religare, which is the binder to control the mind. Instead of religio, which means to bring together, um, which, you know, you can say any hierarchy brings people together. No, it doesn't. It pushes certain people below and keeps certain people above. And what doesn't is actually an ecosystem, not an ego system, right? Mm -hmm. So a circle, not a, not a, <laughs> a, a hierarchical pyramid. So um, we, we want to work together, essentially, because we realize that everyone has an essential asset. Everybody has an essential resource um, and that the leaders cannot be leaders without the followers and that the followers cannot, you know, direct themselves properly without, um, you know, some sort of uh, direct, direct guide, um, you know, with them to which comes about naturally. Right. Because, again, if somebody seeks power, that's the problem. But here's the thing. When we're looking at government in particular. And I, and I said, you know, government started out with this battle on resource here and keeping things away from others. What does that sound like? It sounds like a cult knowledge, doesn't it? A cult means hidden, hidden knowledge. And knowledge is power. And that is a common quote, but it really is. Because if you keep certain knowledge away from people, then like the fact that they're slaves or like what slavery is to begin with, then people don't know maybe if they're enslaved. <laughs> and people don't know, you know, how to free themselves from that slavery in, in addition. Uh, and, and what you have then is a system where, again, certain people have knowledge that other people don't and to keep that knowledge away, how education, religion, etc. So science as well, right? All these forms of mental constructs that are often very much man-made, not coming from nature directly um, or malformed uh, <laughs> natures to, to be exact, denatured. Uh, elements and they are pushing down people's natural ability to work with one another and to say hey you know i i, I own myself i could take responsibility of my own life i can i can protect myself I, I have guns you know i i have the ability to do so but some people just feel like they straight up don't have the ability anymore and that's where robotics comes in is robotics okay we can replace your arm with a machine you know we can uh we can change your whole life and we could just rechange it we'll make it perfect you know it's like this utopian dream like what we're asking for is not a utopia the government's asking for a utopia claiming that you know with government in place that's what makes society somehow somewhat perfect um and that if we find the perfect form of it it'll just work. But uh, <laughs> let's look at history. And let's look at what our founding fathers tried to do. You know, let's look at the, these examples. Let's look at this. Let's move on toward the future and understand that slavery is a thing of the past and it's still in the present. You know, not, there's nothing new under the sun is, is the common phrase. There's always going to be some sort of form of oppression and control. The question is, how is it manifested? How does it manifest? You know, how does it manifest in the first place? Order followers, people letting it happen. Good people generally believing and in giving bad people the permission to do bad and bad people fooling good people into doing bad and following orders essentially so they can do whatever they want um, because, you know, they're suppressing their internal conscience. So that is the problem with the world. And uh, I'm sorry if I went a little off on that, but that's what creates slavery is people giving away their ownership, their responsibility to own themselves. Here's still the nagging question that comes at me, because I know this is what I hear from people when I get into conversation. Sure. They say, um, they say, okay, they would say in this 
you know, after what you said, they would say, okay, yeah, that all, that all makes sense about one person owning another person. But my boss that I work for doesn't own me. You know, I could leave any time, you know, I could quit. Mm -hmm. And I'm just doing this job because I want the retirement or I want the money, but I have the choice. And therefore I'm not a slave, you know? Yep. So that's, I think, the argument that your average person would make. So why don't you see what you could do to explain in that situation, James? You know, what well, would you I say? Just, I mean, I know, well, I, I, there's, geez, there's so much there. Listen to Corey, it's just a lot, there's a lot of reference. <laughs> yeah. Points. But, uh, you know, but just, I guess, really to, okay, to go into like, really, what is the, what is, what are the facts of the situation that we are in as wage slaves? And no one wants to hear that wage slavery is a ex thing. And, and the fact of the matter is there is, you know, we, we mentioned people like Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King. It's, these are people with compassion. And, you know, these are sick and suffering people. But also, like I, someone like Mark Passio is uh, perhaps maybe more abrupt where I, maybe there is a balance between there are people that you have to just be in their face and say, this is the way it is. And there are people that are really just caught in the grind that really are, have never been given any kind of information and really just, you know, not everybody has the wherewithal to walk away from their job and say, all right, I'm on the street now. I'm going to take care of myself. It's just some people just don't have that, you know, and some people, you know, and some people are so wore down that the idea of fighting against someone who's been beating them into the ground because of their job for, you know, 10 years, it's just, it's too much. So I think that's the compassion. I mean, that's I think that's where maybe it's the place for people to be speaking, and that's where leaders call to to maybe be there when people like that need someone to step up for them a bit. But uh, it made me think of the um, the conversation with uh, Richard Grove and John Taylor Gatto, and they talked about you know people about the North and the South, and during slavery they were said he said you know the people. He, he suggested, John Taylor Gatto suggested, he said, he says the, the group that was the biggest proponent behind the abol abolition of slavery was actually the housewives of the Southern plantation owners. He says, because, they, they, you know, the plantation owners would disappear for, a, you know, a few hours going to, you know, doing whatever they were doing. And there happened to have been light, light skinned slaves running all around the plantations. So it was going under as it was. And, and it says also, but beyond that, which these are hard things to talk about because the implications of what it is. But also, you know, I, I, I put a skit about this together, but it's like, you know, having slaves is expensive. You know what I mean? You have people who are healthy. What if what happens when a slave gets sick? The owner has to take care of that slave. What happens when they get old? There's only so many you can walk out and sort of get lost in the forest before and, you know, get rid of them before the rest of the slaves get up. And then what do you get? You got to stop production, right? So what's a great way to take care of that? Well, all right, have them pay for it, have the wage slaves pay for their own room and board, have them pay for their own health care. And when they get die, well, all right, well, they're going to have to deal with it then, you know? So when to suggest that that's really the, the, the root of what our, our salary system is now, and that even before that, it was, it was considered for someone to rent themselves out was considered slavery as wage slaves. So these are really factors that exist in our economic system that we just don't talk about, you know, and uh, it's hard. And, and really the truth, is, and the fact of the matter is where we are today, especially with the pension system. And it's so, it, that, that, there, that goes back to the monarchy. That's the pension, so title and pension system is, is a leveraging mechanism of the monarchy. And it's not knocking that. I understand, like, especially in New York, you're the small area where people have to work. People needed these kind of things. But it's so, I guess, going back to natural law or principles like inalienable rights endowed by the creator. But the reason why they, de they declared those rights was because against divine right. Divine right, there were people, there were human beings that had believed in an ideology that other people complied to that said they had divine right to rule that was backed by the, you know, by uh, the vicar who said he was talking for God and that they have the blood running through their veins gave them right to rule and subjugate the rest of the world. And then we said, or the, found, the, fall, the founding fathers, these people, these men said, we declare that that is bullshit. 
<laughs> inalienable rights endowed by the creator says that we are all free from the breath and uh, you know so uh and then the con so these things are just even our democracy is if is is supposed to be derived from those principles but our democracy is now derived from the principles of wall street the centralization of the economy so we we do we, we are totally we don't act from any of these principles whatsoever so a whole society is ba and the education system is really all based on a conditioning of how does and and what has happened is people and this is really what it comes down to and i understand it and anybody most people you know people make this compromise and it's very hard and what do the people do they call it being responsible so if someone has a child, say, say a young couple, they're enjoying their life and they have, uh oh, so we're having a baby, <laughs> you know? So, all right, well, someone's got to get a job and be responsible. You know what I mean? And that's not a bad thing, but what has happened is this is this, these words, these now, so they have into the system. Then someone's now someone is in and they make these compromises to go into the system, but they start being successful and then they start getting comforts and then they start getting rewards and they forget there was ever a compromise. So it's really a lulling into the system. And then when they get really comfortable, then they want to protect their comforts. Yes. And it's really it's such a detachment from our natural, because, and for me, the roots, really the roots, it, like uh, Corey suggested, it, it does lie in thought. It, it, cause it, and really for me, what happens is we live in this reactionary life, but we, instead of the reactions being all negative, we have these indulgences that are placed in. So the more we maximize our power to consume, the more times we have to engage into gratification rather than the grind of need. So that's what freedom is. Freedom is I'm, I'm in the grind. I'm going to accept this, but I'm going to maximize my capacity for consumption so I can be out of a grind and be in more of a comfortable space, but I'm still enacting in the grind mechanism which is wage slavery, you know, but I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. So that's kind of here. I'm going to share. Um, I'm going to do a little share screen here. This is a um, sneak kind of a sneak preview of a presentation I'm working on. Can you guys see that? Yes. Um, and that's something I'm going to be doing this Thursday on the one great work network on a live show. Nice. Um, but it's kind of why I'm bringing the subject up because this is what's on my mind This is what I'm working on. So when I looked up slavery, um, the Cambridge Online Dictionary had this written, the activity of legally owning other people who are forced to work for or obey you. So, you know, in the traditional sense, like we're discussing, you know, someone's forced to work for you, you know, and then like I was saying, in the contrast is most of us, our jobs are not actually by force on the first level of things. You can leave when you want, you just don't get paid. But that money that you owe, that has to happen one way or another. You're, you're always gonna have the bills in terms of what type of tip bills are there. There's utilities, there's food. Those things are all voluntary for the most part. You don't have to have a house over your head if you don't want, but you do have to pay the taxes, okay? And that starts from day one when you're born and, and you're not tattooed like a cow or branded like an animal but it's virtually the same thing. You've given a number. And yeah. if you try to get away without your kid having that number, you're in trouble, you're an enemy of the state. So that number is your social security number. Then later comes the driver license. But these cards and numbers follow you all through your life, everywhere you go. And you're not accepted into um, aspects of society without them. And they predicate that you're going to owe this money every year. And if you don't pay that money then, you really find out that you are owned because if you decide you don't want to pay that money or you don't like what they're doing with that money, um, you're forced to either pay it or end up in prison or face the consequences, which can be all level of things. And that's when you find out that you are forced because you have, you're forced to obey. And that is slavery when you're forced to obey. Yeah. And so there are a lot of ways that our society and the structures of our society keep that going and a lot of it depends on us, like you guys were saying, believing and following with it. So, I mean, let's kind of gear our conversation from here on, on how do we, you know, what do we do about this problem? 
you know, I'm sure there's still people that are going to have trouble with the term, no matter how many times we try to explain it. Sure. But for those that get it, what do we do about it? Okay. Uh, so really good things mentioned, um, James, Chris, really good stuff. Um, and I, I know it can be a touchy subject for some people. I mean, you know, but the thing is, it, you know, 1800s is typically the time period we look at when we look at slavery, but it's been happening for a very long time. And it's happened to all cultures around the world. Um, and there are, I, I list a lot of definitions in, in that documentary, um, all the ones I, at least I can find. So that's a really good one too, um, Chris. And I think that's really telling for um, our uh, situation. Uh, it, it is important to note that in the 1800s, you had a very common, um, famous newspaper that really helped free the slaves at the time, right? They say free the slaves um, from their physical slavery. Um, William Lloyd Garrison was somebody who wrote the newspaper called The Liberator. And he's known for a quote where it says, I don't own anybody and nobody shall own me. And basically saying that, you know, no one should, rule, no, actually his, his words were, no one should rule over me and I won't rule over anyone. You know, like it, it's, and that's, a, that's, that says it all. And Lysander Spooner was somebody also in that time period who wrote about natural law, who was an anarchist. Oh my gosh, scary means no rulers. Okay. And an abolitionist. Okay. Which means he's against slavery. Uh, that was the term they gave them. I guess you can say we're modern abolitionists. But <laughs> um, I think uh, what James was saying toward the end was about the fear of freedom, too, because um, there's a common quote as well, where slavery is peaceful and freedom is dangerous. Yeah, well, security and slavery go hand in hand. If you feel a false sense of security, that somebody will watch over you and make sure that, you know, they'll protect you and everything like that, you'll she'll be a slave because you're not taking you're not controlling your own life you're not protecting your own life and family when you should and by the way most things happen within seconds so the the cops are like minutes away so they're not going to be able to help you in pretty much any scenario in fact that's what gets the government involved you have a third party and then you have to go through all their systems and then you get controlled and you have to use their debt fiat money like you said <laughs> james um but there's a fear of freedom involved where Oh my gosh, we're free now. What do we do? The slaves said when they were detached from their physical slavery. Now I have to have a house. Now I have to, now I have to fend for myself. What do I do? So people in today's world, they're afraid of what would happen in a world that's truly free. Um, so they fear the, the state of freedom just as the slaves did in their, in their physical slavery. Um, it's the same exact thing. Uh, again, you know, we're looking at the same definition of slavery um, and applying it to mental slavery, which is the worst type said by the former slaves themselves. So this is important. And when James mentioned um, like the, the, the divine right, that's how government was created. I mean, essentially combined with what you said, Chris, which is um, this monopolized force and violence. That's how government is created in the first place. Keep certain resources away from people, use violence to control them so they stay in their state of servitude. And then in addition to that, give them the belief that you have the right to rule. And what's the best way to do that? A religion, a priest class called the Sumerians thought they actually had the right by God to be superhuman, supernatural beings that actually have the right to rule over the slaves below who are peasants who can't do anything. They're weak. They can't fend for themselves. They need us. So they think they have the moral obligation to rule and they think the slaves have a moral obligation to obey. It's a total belief system. And so if we have to free ourselves from that, we focus on the belief system. So when people say we got to fight within the system, go within the system and, and try to tear it down, you're not actually having to go within the system. You have to go within yourself, within your mind, within the minds of everybody around you, everybody around you, not within the select few who claim to rule over you. There's millions of us compared to them. All we have to do is awaken them with conversation, awareness, education. Okay, what I say is the three main steps, education, representation, and networking, otherwise known as representation, demonstration, and presentation otherwise known as integration and promotion. And at the same time, disintegration and demotion from that which does not belong. It's adding in the crowd out, adding in the good to crowd out the bad naturally, because you're not adding anything new into existence if you're showing people the truth that is all present around them universally. You're simply opening their eyes. 
to what is here. So you're not introducing anything new. And thus you're simply saying, this is what it is. This, this is how it is. And, and here's the example of it in action. And you're like, wait, what? I actually can look up to the sky. I see lines in the sky now. Oh my gosh. You know, people don't look up in the sky and realize that there's lines in the sky. Like it's right above you, but this is an example. Okay. COVID it's an invisible thing, but people believe it's there. Okay, they, they don't know if it's actually there, but because they're told that it's there and that the media says, oh my gosh, you know, COVID drill and you got to wear a mask and all this stuff. People are like frantic about their lives. Like I need to stay away from this at all costs and they don't see it. They're outside walking with masks. Okay, and they're not even around anybody. They're outside walking with it. Do you think at all about your natural immune system? Do you ever think at all about nature around you and, and how beautiful the day is and the good things that are in life and not all the fear-based propaganda that's pushed in your face because fear keeps you in the low state for control but that's what we have to escape from right so what do you do if i said that's a bad thing then you do the very opposite so you're asking what's the solution oh my gosh what's the solutions everyone asks what's the solutions i don't know do the very opposite of the bad things that i mentioned you don't want fear promote love okay you, you don't want uh, you know what they're pushing onto you, then promote the opposite, you know, and, and share that with people. Okay. Don't just keep it for yourself and be like, okay, I'll be fine. If I make sure I have this and all that share with us, save lives. Do you care about the other people, you know, in, in your life? We, you will become a natural leader essentially, you know, if you speak up about the truth that you see ever so present, because that's what these natural leaders did in the past. That's all they did. They spoke up about the truth at the time. They didn't have to know every aspect of the truth, but because they saw aspects there of it, the, the truth is so powerful that it just rose to the top instantly because they had numbers of people together. It, it brought it up with it. And that's why I say representation. And that's why I have a movement because a movement is what gathers the numbers that Mark Passio talks about. And a movement is what can bring all of us together and it can move us in the direction toward our goals that we can identify, you know, clear and distinctively, yes, Natural law, clear and distinctively, statism is a problem, which is order following, you know, which is suppressing conscience, which is a lack of responsibility, which is a lack of ownership, all those things associated. Okay, if we can identify that, which a movement can do very well, because it, it highlights an idea and it brings it to the world, then we can change the world, but we have to come together, we have to bring those ideas together, we and that's what creates the numbers, which is what Mark Pascoe calls the one great work. And so that's what we're here to do. And Chris is on the one great work network. I'm on the network. But what we need to create is a real life movement of everybody, you know, and I think everybody's already a part of it. The matter is of contribution and realization to recognize all the present truths that are already here. Again, we're not introducing anything new. We're simply saying this is what's here. And do you see it as well? Great. Now let's take the action together and disintegrate from the system that doesn't belong. Let's stop paying taxes together. Let's stop obeying their, their, their laws together and defend ourselves with use of force, the right to self-defense against the aggressors who seek to use violence against us to try to keep their control. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I love everything you talked about, Corey. And um, I want to touch on um, Lysander Spooner. But I want to let James go next, and then I'll finish up. Yeah, uh, yeah, all good stuff. You know, I think the reason, like, I, well, I, my, my website's truthtoday.org at the bunker, and I, I have a, an ongoing conversation, which is the roots of occupation. And for me, yeah, I mean, I think one thing, it resides in the realm of thought. I think slavery on both ends. Because for someone, say, the Sumerians or anyone who believes that they have divine right it it really is a belief system that resides in a thought process and a belief that they they believe and act out and then the, the people comply are just on the upper side for whatever reason they they have this belief system i mean so for, but unfortunately i don't think it's hard i think all what we could do is take actions like the lead or maybe you know you know lead by example you know i think if people turned off if people are able to turn off the tv turn off or stop try to stop the just as an initial stage try to stop the in you know the instant gratification because really what they are they're bars of sitting with ourselves because we we've conditioned not to be able to be uncomfortable 
You know, if some, when someone gets uncomfortable for a second, never mind with the truth, but just to be uncomfortable where people can't sit still for two seconds without having to do something on consumption. So I think anybody, if, if someone, so I think the awareness, I don't know, it's very difficult because I don't think anybody can really bring the truth to anybody else. But by sharing it, people understand, people are uncomfortable, people know what's going on. But I think like as Corey hit on another thing too, it's security. It's this, this need, this, this dependence on security or in, internal security. And it's really an illusion. You know, most of, most of the ideas we have of security is an illusion. And it is the mechanism of control that people have. Um, so, but I really think, because I think underneath the truth lies. And I think if, like I heard somebody say in a couple of things, like once we can see the falseness for the false, it falls away because it's just not true. And then hopefully maybe there's some more bullshit underneath. But if we keep on doing that, you know, through negation, we come upon that which is. And it's not my perception of it. It's not my belief in it. It's this is what it is. And that, for me, that's whether it's a natural law, whether it's a principle, whether it's a situation. But I think it's important for people to talk that are aware because that's for me. And I don't know. I really don't know. For me, I had to bang my head on a wall, like, and be like, what the fuck is going on? Like I was, you know, what, the, what on earth is happening here? Something's <laughs> fucked up. This, this is something's wrong here. What the hell's going on? You know? And I, I can't figure it out. I, and really, I just really had other people that I was able to, I, cause I, I had fixed ideas and it took for me to talk to really bang my head on the wall in my own foolish way. And then say, okay, I, I stopped and told, spoke to someone that seemed to have a clue, but I was willing to listen. Mm. And so, and I think people need that willingness to, to make a change. And otherwise it's just impossible. Yeah. So, I, but like, I, so, can I mention so, something real quick? Cause yeah. you, you, you made me think this, I just want to mention it real quick. Yeah. Uh, like inspiration, I think is, is the, cause I didn't mention that, like this inspiration is important because like, you're right. Like I, I, the truth actually can't come from somebody else. And I think it's important you mention that because we can only like point the way to show the way to maybe get there, you know, and help them maybe come to that themselves, but they have to come to it themselves. So they have insecurities within themselves. And if they fix that insecurity within themselves with inspiration and to push them out of that, then, you know, they're not going to seek external security from their environments. Um, and they're going to feel like they can take power. And, and that's the authoritarianism, because they think that there has, they have to know what the next step is. Our outcome-based education is the thing is like, oh, no, every step has to be planned. And people aren't able to say, okay, what do I do now? You know what I mean? And that insecure, you know, and so never mind having that thing is, okay, I'm, I'm okay to be, yes, yeah. So, yes, I, I totally agree. And, I, and, it, and, and the more, and like, as you said, the more people see people doing it, they're more likely to take the step outside of their, that barrier that they're blocking. So yes, it is. It's very important. The more people that speak, the more people that are taking actions of freedom in just living their lives or the person that walks down the street without a mask, the person that does these things like yourself or the people who are speaking to other people without being afraid that one person may just take that one step into that direction. And that's yeah. maybe that's all it needs for one day, you know, and that's the thing. It's all just little steps we take. You know, so yes, yes, yeah. Express I would yourself, say, yeah. I would say from my, you know, it, it's difficult to explain this to someone who's not getting it, but it, it needs to be said that yes, the situation is a situation of slavery. And for me, it was interesting that you brought up Lysander Spooner because that name was sort of a turning point for me when I heard about Lysander Spooner and listened to a podcast about him and started reading about him. That was on my path to kind of really first understanding what freedom is. And uh, that was like, I'm already 40 years old at that time. So I lived for 40 years digging a hole for myself, basically. You know, um, I love that I raised, that I raised kids and I started a family and, you know, started buying a house and all those things. But all those things I did also made it that much more difficult once I mm -hmm. came to understand what freedom means that now I'm pretty embedded in the system. You know, I've been paying taxes all this time. I've been doing the type of work that requires paying those 
and I've been, um, I'm just embedded in so many ways. And so at the point when I realized, okay, freedom is about taking responsibility for my own actions in life and figuring out a way to do something like kind of what Lysander Spooner was doing, where you create value for people. You know, he was delivering mail and um, you can do something of value and then someone trades you a value. It's just me and that person. And so um, in the time in my life since, I quit, at one point I quit a job, you know, I was working for the government and I realized I didn't want to get paid with stolen money anymore. It goes against my beliefs, my morals. So I quit that job. And ever since then, I've been working more towards finding jobs and work that, that don't have to do with the government. And it's not an easy process, you know? And, and so one way you can do it is to get out of the grind is to learn to be an entrepreneur, to learn to start your own business you know, to learn to make something of value and trade it for people for something of value. If we can get away from the money system right now, that's one of the most sinister controlling forces in the world. You know, we could find ways around that, that'd be great, but that's not easy. In the meantime, we take one little step at a time and we, and I think what we can do and what I'm seeing like in, with my friends in autonomy, there's a lot of people out there that are learning how to, to network with each other and with like-minded people and, and just give each other things of value. And that person gives you something of value and we can actually live on our own communities. And the freedom cells is another opportunity of a way to start doing that. Mm -hmm. You find other people in your community that have begun to understand what freedom means that you have a choice about what you do with your life and you'd make dealings with those people and you can cut out the middleman. You don't need to pay somebody else half of your money you know, in order just right. to exist, you know, so you can keep having your number. Anyway, yeah. uh, Zoom's going to shut me down here. So it's been a great meeting. I want to <laughs> share both of your websites and your links when I share sure. this episode. So thanks for putting them on the, the Discord channel. And um, if you guys want to try to make any closing remarks we can, but I think it's going to shut us down in less than a minute here. Yeah, just thanks. Great, great talking to you, Corey. Great talking to you, Chris, as always. Uh, appreciate the conversation. Yeah, thank you, James. It's nice meeting you. You're from New York? Yeah. That's awesome. I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania. So oh, I'm cool. like actually kind of close <laughs> to New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So um, yes. I, I could tell once you start cursing out, I'm like, yep, he's from New York. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yep. It's, it sounds like my dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, well, my father was living up in Pennsylvania for, yeah, well, we got to keep staying in touch, man. I'll, I'll yeah, we on. should. We should. Yeah. That would be cool. But uh, yeah, thank you, Chris, uh, for everything. And yeah, um, I have a, I have a, I have a link on my website for about freedom cells. It's probably gonna kick us out. Uh, oh, cool. It's slash freedom cells on my website. So nita.one slash freedom cells, uh, okay. because it talks about like the incomplete nature of freedom cells. Cause I, I feel like it, there, it, if we want to turn it into more of a movement, it can make more of an impact, you know, because obviously there's a place for my movement. Like where does it come into place and how does it? So I made sure to talk about that. So I made a little page for that. You can check it out if you want. <laughs> Excellent, right on. Good work, Corey.